Hello everyone. In this uh, lecture, we're going to be talking about how to determine the solubility of organic compounds in water and some other organic solvents. Or another way of saying, how do you determine something is polar and nonpolar just based on qualitative uh, purposes, not quantitative, and that's how your question is going to be for the most part when you take organic chemistry, is be able to identify if a if two out of the two given compounds, which one will dissolve in water more and which one will dissolve in, let's say, nonpolar solvent more. So there are the theory behind dissolving a compound in a given solvent uh, goes back to Gen Chem, where you have learned saying like dissolves like, which means if you have a polar compound, it will dissolve in polar solvents such as water and some other polar solvents are like methanol or ethanol. But obviously, water is the most commonly polar solvent you're going to be seeing in there. And uh, usually, the question is going to be if a given compound can be dissolved in water or not. And then at the same time, if you have a nonpolar compound, they will dissolve in a nonpolar solvent such as hexane, benzene, toluene. These are some of the most common nonpolar solvents. In addition to that, I did want to want to mention that there are some solvents that has a slightly polar bonds on them, but even um, even having a polar bonds overall, they are considered to be nonpolar, such as uh, diethyl ether, dioxane, and chloroform. So those are the most common ones you're going to be seeing as we move along in the organic chemistry. What really determine if a given compound will dissolve in water or not? All right. So there is a rank, like those are the things you kind of look for in a given compound. And if you do have that, that will make the compound to be soluble in water. So the first thing in the order is if you have a charged grip, which means if you have a an a cation or the anion, that's going to be dissolving in water. They are very hydrophilic. And that's why a lot of salt that you have uh, learned about in Gen Chem, they will dissolve in water. And there are solubility rules. Not all of them will dissolve, but most of them will dissolve. And the bottom line is, as long as you have a charge on something, it will dissolve in the water. And then there are going to be times when you have like a really long chain where uh, you have an hydrophobic end and a hydrophilic end, like such as this right there. And you can have, suppose, this guy right there. So you have this last one is your charged. So this is going to be the hydrophilic. And then this right there is going to be your hydrophobic, which means it hates water. Um, so depending on how long your hydrophobic is, your hydrophilic is still going to take over and it's still going to be dissolving in water. But at some point when your hydrophobic chain gets really long, then it's going to be not dissolving in water. Or another way of saying it, it's going to make it a micelles where it will have the, your hydrophilic attracted to the water and the other side will be attracted to the nonpolar compound. And that's how the soap actually works because they kind of get together in a way where the hydrophilic uh, ends are being attracted by the water and these hydrophobic ends are attracting the dirt or the oil from the clothes. So that's the first thing you're always going to look for if there is a charge to grip on the molecule. Then the second thing is you look for the hydrogen bond donors in the molecule. So your hydrogen bond donor is going to be obviously coming from you know, alcohols, like you have an ROH grip, or you have an amine or an amide, it's like RNH2 group. So remember, as long as you have a hydrogen attached to either oxygen or nitrogen or fluorine, that's gonna be con that hydrogen is gonna be considered a hydrogen bond donor. So if you have a hydrogen bond donor, they contribute to the solubility in toward the water very significantly. If you have a hydrogen bond acceptor, so hydrogen bond acceptors do also contribute to the solubility, but they are not, they're a little bit less in terms of the contribution compared to the hydrogen bond donor. So, um, you know, you could have like an CO bond or you can have an CN bond. So as long as you have a nitrogen or an oxygen in the given molecule or even like in a fluorine in the given molecule, it has the capability of making hydrogen bond. 
as long as you have another molecule or as long as you have you know water close by that can make a hydrogen bond with this fluorine or you can have a hydrogen from the water that can make hydrogen bond with this nitrogen but in terms of the order if you have a hydrogen bond donor group that's going to be that's going to be contributing more toward your solubility toward the water compared to the hydrogen bond receptors. And also, you all also have to look for the hydrophobic groups. If you have a, too many groups that can, that you, if you have a big group that contains carbons and hydrogens only, then sometimes that's going to take over and that's going to decrease the solubility in water. So we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Other polar groups has small uh, contribution toward the solubility, like such as you can have a carbon chlorine bond or you could have a carbon bromine bond or you have a carbon um, sulfur bond. So they are going to be polar. They're going to be contributing just a little bit, but not much. So that's going to be the hierarchy order. And then obviously the last one here is, is actually going to be creating the hydrophobicity. So if you have a lot of carbon atoms in the chain, it's going to be hydrophobic and they're going to be less soluble in water or they're going to be almost insoluble in water. And those hydrophobic compounds will be dissolving in nonpolar compounds. So sometimes you know, you may think, okay, why are we really talking about only water here? Why not in a nonpolar solvents? Well, if you understand what compounds dissolve in water, it's going to be easier or it's just going to be opposite to what compounds dissolve in the nonpolar salt. So let's look at some of these examples. You got to figure out which one dissolve in water the most and which one dissolves in water the least based on the properties that just we talked about. In this first example, I got the OH group. So, you know, the common thing in all three um, structures here is the OH group. And you do have a hydrogen bond donor here because the hydrogen is directly attached to the oxygen. But the difference here is the hydrophobic chain. So you got two carbons there. And here you have three carbons. And it, obviously here you got more than three carbons. You got about six carbons in there. So as your chain gets bigger your solubility in water goes down so this first one having the smallest chain of the hydrophobic group here and uh, this OH is going to take over and it's going to be the most soluble so this would be the most soluble in water and this one will be the least soluble so the one that's going to be least dissolving in water is going to be actually most dissolving in nonpolar solvent. So I can also say if this dissolve, it's least soluble in water, then I can also say this is going to be the most soluble in nonpolar solvents, such as hexane and uh, toluene and stuff like those. OK, what about this next one? Um, there is a hydrogen bond acceptor here. This oxygen is going to be acting as a hydrogen bond acceptor. And you have a very similar scenario in every one of those, in every one of those structures. But then again, the difference is the carbon chain. You got a smaller carbon chain here, and then your carbon's kind of getting bigger as you're moving along from left to right. So same story. This is going to be the most soluble and this is going to be the least in water. So we're only going to be referring to water and if you have to figure out in nonpolar solvents it's just going to be opposite. Okay, what about this third one here? Um, obviously you got uh, this OH here that's going to be capable of making hydrogen bonds. So you do have a hydrogen bond donor and a hydrogen bond acceptor. But when you look on the right side here, you got an O- minus there and an Na plus there. And remember, your charged molecules or charged ions are going to take over in terms of your solubility. So having a charged species on the chemical or on the compound will make this more soluble in water. So this is going to be more soluble. There's uh, the other stuff stays the same. They got a big hydrophobic group here. And uh, so what's going to be really determining is what type of hydrophilic group you have. So having a charged group is make makes this more hydrophilic. 
Okay, what about this next one here? So this next one, there are constitutional isomers where the formula is going to be the same. It's a C2H6O in both cases, but obviously the connectivity is different. So one has an alcohol function group. So this is your alcohol. And this does have an hydrogen bond donor. And this oxygen right there is, this is going to be an ether function group. And this ether function group is going to be only hydrogen bond receptor. So, it's, so having a hydrogen bond donor kind of takes the priority over the hydrogen bond receptor. So this, is, this one is going to be more soluble in water. As the chain gets bigger on the ethers, they become uh, more insoluble in water. What about this next one here? Well, there is a big difference in the next one. There is an NH2 group that's capable of making hydrogen bonds, but there's really nothing there. This is all nonpolar. All right, so this can make hydrogen bonds. As a result, this is going to be more soluble in water. And if I want to compare this next, the second one, the nonpolar one, will be less soluble in water, or I can even say this is going to be more soluble in a nonpolar solvent. Okay, what about uh, this next one right there? So we got an ether function group there. We got an OH there, and then this is also that's a hydrogen bond acceptor there. So H bond acceptor, and you do have an H bond acceptor here as well. Uh, but then the question is, uh, between those two, you have these th uh, some of these extra carbon groups. So more carbons you have, more hydrophobic it's going to be. So I'm going to be saying, okay, the one that has the OH is going to be the most soluble in water. And the one that's going to have the, the biggest number of carbon groups is going to be the least soluble in water. Okay, and sometimes uh, you got to compare how many hydrogen bonds you can make, or if you have both hydrogen bonds and acceptors in there. Like in this next example, nitrogen is indeed in a hydrogen bond acceptor, but this first one has two hydrogens there, so those are also hydrogen bond donors. But when I look at second one here, there is a hydrogen bond donor and there is a hydrogen bond acceptor as well. But here in the first one, you have two hydrogens. And now in this secondary amine here, you have one hydrogen only. So this is in a secondary amine. This is in a primary amine. And this third one is going to be in a tertiary amine. So tertiary amine is only going to be hydrogen bond acceptor. So only H bond acceptor. So since it's the H bond acceptor only, it's going to be the least soluble. So that's going to be the least. And the first one is going to have the most hydrogen bond donors. This is going to be the most soluble in water. Sometimes you can alter the solubility of the compounds in water by treating those with acid and base. So uh, just as an example here, so both of these, so this first one is called an aniline. And this second one is called a phenol. Now, both of these are insoluble in water. And the big reason is uh, they might be partially soluble. For the most part, they are insoluble. And the big reason is this hydrophobic end there. Even though both of those are actually capable of making hydrogen bonds because you got the NH on the top there and the OH on the bottom there. So even though they are capable of making hydrogen bonds, but still they have this hydrophobic group that kind of takes over in terms of the interaction, so it's going to be less soluble in water. But then also keep in mind that this NH2 act as a bronston lowry base. So this is going to be acting as a base. So if, wanna, if I want to increase the solubility of this, I can go ahead and add some sort of acid. So let's say I add an HCl to it. So when I add an HCl to it, what's going to happen Copy that down, put it right here. So then you're going to have multiple hydrogens. So you already have two hydrogens there. Let me change the color there. 
So those two hydrogens were already there, but then this uh, hydrogen from the acid is going to be accepted by this base here. So now you got three hydrogens on this nitrogen, and all of a sudden you got a positive charge on that. So And then you're going to have a Cl minus. So all the, when you make this in a cation here, that's going to be more soluble. So what... What the bottom line is, to make something like this more soluble in water, you can have, uh, you can add some sort of acid in there. So another way of saying it's going to be more soluble in acidic conditions. Or more soluble when you add a little bit of acid in the water. And sometimes you have to do uh, the other way, where this phenol, the OH, is a little bit acidic there. So I can go ahead and add an NaOH there. So when I add an NaOH, it's going to make a phenoxide. So let me just copy that down here. This act as an acid, and this act as a base. And then when the base grabs the proton from the acid, you're going to have an O minus left over there. And then this makes water. And then obviously your spectator or ion and a plus is just going to be there. So just because now you have created an cation, uh, an anion here rather, it's going to be more soluble in water. So another way of saying, if I want to make a phenol more soluble in water, I can do so in basic conditions. So this is going to be more soluble in basic conditions. Okay, so I'll talk about uh, more um, uh, more about acid, acidic and basic extractions in a different uh, lecture, but I want to have a little bit of touch base about how you can increase the solubility under acidic and basic conditions. But for the most part, you're going to be looking at some of those factors we just talked about in terms of determining the uh, solubility criteria. All right, if you have any questions, feel free to leave any comments in the section below.